The question could be asked, where does Marian devotion begin? Who are the first great figures to talk about Our Lady? And thanks be to God and thanks be to Our Lady, the real answer is it is always there from the time of Jesus Christ in the fullness of oral tradition and living dynamic church. Hello and welcome to MaryCast. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And sometimes when we ask these questions historically, we forget about the origins of where the greatest Christian mysteries are and come from, which always end up with the words of our Lord Jesus. His truth, his oral tradition, which becomes apostolic tradition, which becomes an ongoing living tradition of the church. It's a living, breathing, saving church. So where does Marian devotion begin? It begins with Jesus, and it begins with the apostolic tradition that uh, protects and further develops these truths. Now, I want to talk about some great figures, great Marian figures in the early church, and for that we're going to identify some persons. But I want you to keep in mind as we do this that it's always expressions, individual expressions of a deeper, bigger, richer, supernatural tradition. Let's say, for example, that someone was doing a study of a, let's say, a, a college student when they're at college and saying, you know, I don't see any written documentation that this college student loved their parents during the four years when they were at college. And a, a third party could say, well, what do you mean by that? So, well, there's no written documentation. And the third person can say, the third party can say, well, what about phone calls? What about talking back and forth? What about experiences where the parents came to the school or the, 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 the child went home? Uh, is it really fair to say that because you don't have written documentation, there wasn't love there? And the answer would be no, it's not fair. And it's not fair in the early church either. No, thanks be to God, we do have written documentation of the respect and veneration of the early church for Our Lady. But if there was not, that's not an indication that the living, breathing church did not love the mother as it has always loved the mother and as it continued to love the mother throughout history. Look, Mary is mother of the church. And even in the catacombs, if you go to the, uh, to the great catacombs uh, on the Via Nomentana, you will see an image of Our Lady with an arm outstretched encircling Peter and another arm outstretched encircling Paul. That's Mary in the middle of Peter and Paul. Uh, any master of the catacomb uh, mosaics will tell you that when you're talking about an image on the catacombs, when you're talking about one of the primitive uh, depictions of what's there, when Mary is between Peter and Paul, she is mother of the church. She has the greatest possible position. And it, it kind of beautifully reflects a truth that came out much later by John Paul II, where he says, the church is first Marian and secondly, it's Petrine. What does that mean? It means first and foremost, to be Christian, to be Catholic means you have to imitate Mary to be a handmaid of the Lord. And then, we have the proper role of Peter, the, the critical role of Peter for unity, the vicar of Christ on earth, uh, one of the three elements of the John Bosco triangle of, of Eucharist, Mary and the Holy Father. But if you don't have Mary, my friends, you don't have Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have the church. And even when you do have Jesus and Mary, the church, we, the people of God, must first imitate Mary so that we can be properly submissive to Peter. And so that's the beauty of even an image that comes out of the third, second to third century of the church. So, where does Marian devotion begin? It begins in the heart of Christ, conveyed in the early church through apostolic tradition. And thanks be to God, we do get some written testimony, some written manifestation of this living, breathing love of Our Lady. So, a couple early church figures. First of all, let's go to St. Justin Martyr. St. Justin Martyr dies around 165 AD. Justin Martyr is the first to write about the parallel between Mary, the new Eve, and the first Eve. Uh, sometimes referred to, um, Our Lady is referred to as the second Eve. But Justin Martyr 
as early as the, the middle of the second century was already talking about Mary and Eve, that Mary had a, what we call an antithetical parallelism. That means a, a parallel of opposites, that as Eve was disobedient and lost grace for us, Mary was obedient and merited grace for us. Well, Justin is the first, and I should mention even before Justin, we have St. Ignatius of Antioch, who dies in 107, who strongly defends the virginity of Our Lady and talks about, of course, this truth that Mary says, yeah, which is a gospel truth, Mary says yes to the angel, and it is the Virgin Mary that really protects uh, Mary's, uh, protects the role of Jesus uh, as the God-man. If Jesus has a human father, well then who is Jesus really? If, if Jesus is from a biological father, then he's the result of this man and Mary, not of God the Father. So the virginity of Our Lady is defended by uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, dies in 107. Then we get this, this deeper theology by St. Justin Martyr. Well, the first true Mariologist, we would say, is St. Irenaeus of Lyon. St. Irenaeus, who is a disciple of Polycarp, who is a disciple of John the Evangelist, is the bishop in Lyon, what we would call uh, France now. At that time it was Gaul. He is the first true Mariologist in the sense that he's the first to really um, put forward a, a little bit of a extended treatment of the relationship of Mary with Eve. He's the master of the new Eve revelation. Now, why is that so important? Because most every dogma and doctrine we have regarding Our Lady can be found in this first apostolic and early church image of the Blessed Mother as the new Eve. So, as St. Irenaeus identifies this, again, only in the second century of the church, that Mary and Eve were parallels, except in an opposite way. Irenaeus tells us that Mary was the obedient virgin that said yes to God and becomes the mother of Jesus, but he specifies that Mary becomes the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. My friends, that's, that's an extraordinary statement for the second century. Not only does he say that Mary is a cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race in, in identifying Mary not as what we would call the formal cause, uh, the, 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 the essential cause of salvation is, is of course Jesus Christ. And St. Irenaeus, this great church father, uh, knew that, but that Mary was really the efficient cause. She was a secondary instrumental cause of our salvation uh, because it's Mary's yes that brings us Jesus, who is the Redeemer. Now, what's fascinating is that he would specify in the second century that Mary is a cause of salvation for herself. So, he, he identifies Mary apart from the rest of humanity. This had to be the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, because the idea that St. Irenaeus would have full understanding of this, what does it mean, my friends? It means this. It means that Mary was redeemed first, so that she, as the co-redemptrix, could be the perfect partner with Jesus in redeeming everyone else. And this is a, a clear theological doctrine of the church when we understand Mary in, light, in virtue of her immaculate conception, that Mary was preserved, immune from original sin, precisely so she could be the perfect partner with Jesus in the work of redemption. But second century? That Irenaeus would know that Mary was the cause of salvation for herself, that by Mary saying yes to the angel, Mary also was an instrument which allowed her to be redeemed first and ultimately to be the partner with Jesus in redemption. Well, that's Jesus, the new Adam, and Mary, the new Eve. What do the new Adam and the new Eve do? They work together for human salvation. Second century, my friends, we have the truth that Mary uniquely shares in your salvation and in my salvation. That's why we started by the 14th century calling her the co-redemptrix. More in this series on great Marian figures in history. Come back, we have more in the richness of the church. This is Dr. Mark Mervais saying thanks for being with us at MaryCast. God bless you.